This video will be a follow-up on the previous video, Noise, a Physical Hazard in the Workplace. We will be discussing ways that we can actually measure noise in the workplace, as well as a general overview on what is required in a workplace hearing conservation program. So why do we want to measure noise in the workplace? This may be because there have been reports of workers describing symptoms such as tinnitus or difficulties communicating due to noise levels in the workplace. We may also want to identify potential sources of noise in the workplace and control for them as much as possible. Finally, there are also national regulations that workplaces need to comply with in terms of exposing workers to noise. So how do we go about identifying noise hazards in the workplace? First, we perform a preliminary assessment. This includes performing a walkthrough survey, which would be the initial way to identify potential sources and locations of noise, whether this be machinery or work processes. It is also important to note that noise exposure of the worker may vary throughout the day. We would also need to have a look at the worker's schedule to see what type of work they're doing, whether there is continuous or occasional exposure, the length of work shifts, and any changes in location that may affect the overall average exposure. This is so that we can determine the exposure level for each type of job classification. So how do we perform measurements of noise in the workplace? Field measurements of all possible sources of workplace noise is usually performed by an occupational hygienist using specific instruments. There are three types of instruments. These include a noise level meter. This consists of a microphone which detects small air pressure variations associated with sound. The SLM records sound pressure levels at one instance in a particular location. These are displayed in decibels, typically with an A-weighted filter. Another instrument is the integrating sound level meter. This device measures the equivalent sound levels over a measurement period. This could be several minutes, hours to an entire work shift at a particular location. This gives an average noise level over a time period. Finally, the noise dosimeter. This is a small device that is able to be clipped onto a worker's uniform ideally close to the ear. It is able to store an average noise level over a period of time and provide personal exposure measurements as the worker moves to a different location during their shift. Commonly, the dosimeter is worn for a complete shift with settings at criterion level 85 decibel A, which is the maximal permitted noise level, an upper limit of 140 decibel C, and an exchange rate of three decibels which is the increase or decrease in decibels corresponding to twice or half the noise dose. Following the shift, the percentage of maximum permitted exposure is determined. Accurate measurements is dependent on the worker's cooperation. Therefore, education is required in regards to the purpose, the importance of accuracy, wearing the dosimeter at all times during the shift, consequences of tampering with the microphone is critical. In terms of optimal location of the instrument during noise measurements, it is critical to have the microphone position as close as possible to the location of the ears of the worker, typically above the shoulder. If the worker is in a standing position, it should be 1.5 meters above the floor. If they're in a seated position, it should be 1.1 meters above the floor. And finally, they should avoid all shielding between the microphone and noise source. The types of measurements that can be performed are a general noise survey, usually following a grid pattern and produces a noise map of the workplace. Noise level from the source, usually one to three meters from the source. Personal noise exposure of the worker, usually via dosimeter. It is able to calculate an equivalent sound level over an eight hour TWA. And finally, impulse noise. This is noise that occurs with a sudden burst of high intensity sound caused by the impact of two solids hitting each other, for example, a hammer strike. This is usually measured with a dosimeter. Background noise should also be considered when performing noise measurements. 
This is best performed with measurements taken with this noise source on and then off. Depending on the difference between total noise level and background noise level, then the background noise level correction is added as per the table below. With frequency analysis, sometimes in designing specific noise controls, a detailed frequency analysis is often required. For workplace purposes, an octave band analysis is used and is a filter that can be attached to an SLM. It divides the audible sound frequency range into 11 octave bands and allows sound in each octave band to be measured. Now that we've performed a noise survey and taken measurements of the workplace noise levels, we are able to identify whether a hearing conservation program is needed. If there's specific areas in the workplace with excessive noise, we're able to identify particular equipment or work processes that are a source of excessive noise, whether the worker might be exposed to unacceptable noise levels, and the appropriate type and level of controls that are needed. If a workplace is exposing workers to harmful noise, then a hearing conservation program is required. This should follow the industry standards, which in Australia is the ASNZS 1269.1, Occupational Noise Management, Measurements and Assessment of Noise Emission and Exposure. It should also comply with work health and safety regulations in your own country, which in Australia states that the workplace exposure standards for noise is below. In terms of the specific details of a hearing conservation program, they should include discussing the responsibilities. It is the responsibility of the employer to provide a healthy and safe work environment, as well as be familiar with the noise standards and regulations of your country. You need to identify the noise hazards so this includes performing a noise risk assessment specifically targeted towards identifying employees to be included into the program, high risk work tasks or work areas. This is done via worksite surveys, noise monitoring and screening audiometry as discussed previously. Implementing the appropriate controls, whether this is engineering, administrative or PPE as described in the previous video, have periodic health screening, performing hearing questionnaires on workers and baseline audiometry at pre-employment to identify any past exposure or history that may contribute to increased risk, ongoing periodic noise monitoring, as well as documenting what actions are required once an employee has been identified as having significant hearing loss or other hearing conditions, provide education to both management and workers. This is in the nature of noise as a hazard and its effects on health the types of controls, particularly maintenance and storage of PPE, as well as the importance of having periodic hearing evaluations of at-risk workers. Regular record keeping. This includes the importance of confidentiality, as well as communication with the worker's GP or other health providers. And finally, evaluation and review. You will need to measure, monitor, and evaluate the performance of the program and constantly apply any improvements. So in summary, we discuss why we need to measure noise in the workplace, the ways we actually measure noise in the workplace, including the types of instruments used and the particular scenarios they're used in, as well as the specific details of a workplace hearing conservation program. 